Welcome to this presentation around remote production and how JPEX Access plays an important role uh, going forward. Um, I will cover uh, a little bit about the trends within remote production and uh, how JPEG Access can be used and some of the challenges and opportunity JPEG Access brings to this market segment. My name is Thomas Lind. I'm the Director of Product Management at Appear. Um, going a little bit into the trends, uh, we see clearly now there's a big rise of live sports events being broadcasted uh, on the national networks and the global sports network. Um, high value content like Formula One, Olympics, World Cup is becoming very important for these operators uh, in their strategy. Uh, these are of course high value contents and they need to be produced at high quality with high reliability and of course that's an acceptable cost. Um, going forward we also see they are starting to cover more and more sports events. This could be both a sports events that covers lower division of for example soccer or it could be adding new sports uh, that hasn't normally been broadcasted on national TV. Uh, of course, the key for this type of production is reliable, reliable operation, high video quality, and when you go into remote production, the delay becomes a very important factor. For example, Formula One, where things are happening fast, delay is essential. You cannot operate at long delay when doing remote production. The production itself is also interesting. It's moving around from uh, the uh, dedicated on-premise production facilities. Normally that was located in the studios. And now seeing more and more moving out to the cloud, uh, meaning people can be anywhere in the world operating the event uh, from a remote location or producing the event from a remote uh, location. Uh, both cases requires, of course, somehow contributing the content from the event into the production facility at a high quality with low delay and at an acceptable bitrate. Uh, normally we will see this contributed over dedicated IP uh, lines that could be owned by the studio or content owner themselves or it could be rented but it's usually dedicated IP links. Uh, we also now are meeting requests for transmitting this over public IP. Seeing more and more maybe especially for the not the most valued content but for the, the uh, more niche content that uh, 6 SRT with technologies combined with remote production could be an option. Um, of course, high bitrate uh, contribution into the cloud comes with a cost. You need to be, you know, to ingest uncompressed video into a cloud, a public cloud, can be both costly and quite, you know, uh, impossible in some cases to handle the bitrate uh, one would need. If we look at the uh, little bit about uh, when you then go to me, you're standing really in a in an evaluation about trying to find the, the sweet spot between bit rates, quality, and delay. Uh, looking a little bit into the possible technologies one could use uh, in uh, you know in remote production, uh, we can start with the old ATVC, old AVC, and new ATVC uh, in normal delay mode, which would typically give you a delay of 1.8 to 5 seconds lay but can give you a bit rate down to 8 megabit for a standard HD service that being 1080i or 720p50. Um, that is of course not a codec normally used in any production contribution uh, scenario that's used for the distribution uh, going to the end customers. Going into HVC low delay or AVC low delay, you can get sub seconds, typically around 400 to 600 milliseconds, depending on some of the vendors you're using, um, where you can get a delay uh, which is not ideal from a, it's not a sub uh, frame delay, of course, but it still might be an, an acceptable trade off if you have a satellite contribution, which has definitely limited uh, bandwidth. So in with a satellite, you would have to offer your delay to get it within the bandwidth uh, availability on the satellite link. Going down, you know, to the delay, going, uh, you, you can move to HVC ultra low latency. This would require typically more bandwidth per channel than you would have over satellite, but it can be provided delay down to sub 200 milliseconds. It's still not down on the frame, you know, sub frame delay, but, but it could be a trade off where you get the minimum bit rate at maybe an acceptable delay for remote production. Uh, next you have JPEG 2000. JPEG 2000 has been around for years and is of course a technology that 
is well proven and used quite frequently in you know contribution and remote production. Um, it can provide so you know if you have there are two versions of JPEG 2000. One is low delay and the other is standard delay. But the low delay, you can provide delays down to 60 milliseconds area uh, and 150 millibyte, at 150 millibyte megabyte per second ish. This will vary a little bit about what quality you accept the contribution to how far down you can push it. Of course, you the two last one. I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about Tico because Tico was the predecessor to uh, JPEG XS. Tico came around really to find a codec that could do subframe delay. The whole idea was to get something that could provide compression, but at a delay that was less than a frame. Uh, Tico has been replaced by JPEG XS. JPEG XS was actually the first I read about it, called uh, Tico XS. But as it moved into the JPEG standardization part, it is now been called JPEG XS. Uh, we, I believe, we believe JPEG XS will replace JPEG 2000 in the contribution domain. And we think it's a perfect match into remote production due to the sub-frame delay. Uh, so what is JPEG XS? As I said, it's built on the Tico uh, foundation, of what was made in Tico. Uh, it uses Wavelet rather than deck transform, which means that the artifacts is, will be more ringing than the classic uh, HVC, MPEG, uh, or AVC, sorry, uh, and MPEG-2 block uh, artifacts. Um, it encodes per line, so it buffers per line and encode it, so it's, that's why it's a very low latency sub-frame. Uh, uh, it typically can provide a, a lossless uh, compression in the ratio of 10 to 1. If, but you can add the compression ratio maybe say up to 20 and still within acceptable loss. Where the sweet spot goes, if it's 20 or 16, my test initially, I would say 15, 16 is probably the... the if you go beyond 15-16 uh, compression ratio, you're starting to see artifacts. Uh, and this force has the great thing that you can do multiple chain encoding decoding. You can, uh, it supports all the different uh, standardization on, you know, all the different uh, color uh, with 444 down to 422. So it gives you all the options you need in a production uh, that matches your requirements. The interesting part, just as a reference, if you have a standard 380p50 signal, you can fit three cameras into one gig link. If you have a 4K uh, signal, you can actually fit up to eight cameras into a 10 gig link. Or, obviously then, you can have two 8K cameras into a 10 gig link. So it, we feel this is a compression algorithm that meets the requirements in the market and available bandwidth typically one has between events. There are some positive and negative. There are some opportunities and some challenges with, with JPEG XS. Uh, first of all, there are two versions of JPEG XS. The first came was sent uh, based on 2110, sent to 2110. Uh, later, there was a TR07 re uh, standardization released, which actually instead of mapping the data into 2110 packages, are mapping it into transport stream. So what are the advantages and, and disadvantages in these two? 2110 is, of course, mapping directly into the studio environment with the modern studio with 2110 IP-based. Uh, you can you, you split all the assets, audio and video, into different multicasts, into different streams. You can process the audio without having to deal with the video. Uh, you can integrate it with the NMOS, so you can do all the automation and control and management of your network and assets using the NMOS uh, protocols. Uh, and it's by far the most efficient uh, transmission. Um, it, uh, far. It's more efficient than transfer stream because you don't have as much overhead. But there are some challenges. 2110, regardless of this is a JPEG XS compressed or uh, uncompressed, uh, timing is of very much importance. Uh, since all assets are flowing independently, you need a very accurate timing uh, in your network from anywhere that needs to process this data which is then cost based around PTP. And PTP clocks are not trivial to deploy, uh, and it puts definitely some requirements on your network equipment that it needs to support PTP uh, in the foundation. And especially if you go rented networks, that means that you have rented the link between two events or event and a studio. It doesn't mean that you have control over those routers. You just get a bandwidth or guaranteed bandwidth and uh, getting PTP support might be a challenge. Uh, 
And also that involves more complexity on the network side, setting up PTP and getting a fully compliant PTP network from endpoints are also yeah, adding complexity into the networking. Using transport stream is of course then the advantage that you keep all assets together and you take away all the timing issues. You will transmit all audio, video and all auxiliary data in the same container, being transport stream, and map it into uh, you know, to the destination uh, with no timing requirements on the network itself. Uh, this is of course then backward compliant to JPEG 2000, which used to, uh, transport stream as the carrying protocol. Um, it's so then network becomes simpler. It's easier to adapt this into any rented network as long as you just know you have bandwidth control. You you are fairly good to go. Uh, disadvantage: you don't have any NMOS <laughs> control between the encoder and decoder as such, or at least for the network part. Uh, it's less flexible uh, uh, because you can process the, the the components individually, and you add an overhead mapping it into transport stream. These are, there isn't one answer to use transfer stream or to use 2110. It, it needs to match the operator's end requirements. From us, of course, we have great focus on JPEG Access. We are aiming to be the leading provider of solutions involving JPEG Access. Uh, but I would like in our solution, in our X platform, we have two modules that are dedicated for doing JPEG access processing, either encoding or decoding. Both modules can do encoding decoding, that's uh, just the software image you load on it. Um, on the first module, the, the, the one to the left here, uh, is uh, uh, bridging the classic coax uh, studio, where you can take any uh, studio SDI coax inputs and encode it to JPEG access and map it either into transport stream or into uh, 2110. Again, just select the right image, you get the mapping according to what is needed. This is, of course, then can, uh, has two, of course, this has two 12 gig SDI inputs and three 3 gig inputs. Of course, the 12 can take also three gigs, so you can have either eight 3 gigs or two 12 gigs. But if you need to compress, then the maximum number of inputs you can have is four HD. Uh, or lower resolution, that means 1080p 50 or 60 or lower. Uh, or you can do two Ultra HD uh, services. We have exactly the same module, doing exactly the same, uh, but with an IP frontend to bridge the modern studios that has 2110, N, uh, 2110 infrastructure. For these, we take an uncompressed 2110, could also in the future potentially be 2022-6, but for now we focused on 2110. Uh, and ingest it and compress it to JPEG access. This has slightly higher uh, capability for un your encoding HD services. It can do six HD services or two ultra HD. The, the same uh, number of channels applies if it's an encoder and decoder, it's exactly the same. So uh, these two modules enables you to bridge older networks with newer networks. So let's say on the stadium, you have a 2110 infrastructure in your studio, you have a, a coax network, or maybe vice versa, you have a, a coax network at the studio, but you have a, a 2110 network in the production facility. These modules can be applied regardless. They can also be used to contribute into the cloud, of course, and you will only sit at the event side, but it will give you the option to, to contribute the services into the cloud. Uh, so, uh, this was what I want to go through. I would, of course, stress that the whole thing is quite complex. So if you have questions, please contact us. Uh, we uh, are here to help you and answer any questions you might have. Uh, well then, th thank you for watching.